<laughs> we try to make this as simple as possible for everyone. All right, so we have people starting to join us. Let's give it a little while for people to join in. But maybe I can make a screenshot or something, send it to us. Yeah, no, the, the, yes, we'll send you a link to the video, everything. So, all right, so we're starting to get people joining us. Thank you for everyone who is already here. We're gonna give it just a little bit for more people to come into the Zoom room for our Friday lunchtime call. And then we'll get started in just a second. How are you, Tanya? Great to see you. Leila, thank you. Good to see you too. One year, no trouble for me. It's like a prison. Yeah, I, I, th I think with COVID, a lot of people are learning what it's like to not travel, but it's obvious it's different, but we're getting a sense of what it's like to not be able to go anywhere. Um, strange, strange times. Uh, All right, so I think more people will join us. I think we'll just get started with the introductions. I don't want to waste anybody's time, and then we can dive into this, and people can pick us up sort of midway. <clears throat> um, hang on one second. Okay, so good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening from Gaza, and welcome to the fourth session of our eight-part teach-in series entitled Israel-Palestine, where we are, what comes next, and why it matters to Congress. I'm Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and I'm pleased to be co-hosting this series with Khaled El-Gindi, my friend and colleague, who is the director of the Middle East Institute's program on Palestine and Palestinian-Israeli affairs. Take it away, Khaled. Thanks, Lara. Uh, so today's session, as uh, you all probably know, is, the, is on the situation in the Gaza Strip. Uh, to help us learn more about the situation in Gaza, we have assembled uh, another uh, outstanding panel of experts, uh, both uh, some of whom are based in Gaza and, uh, and others um, elsewhere. Their full bios uh, are available on the webpage for this series, but I'll introduce them uh, briefly here in alphabetical order. First, we have Jihad Abu Salim, uh, Palestine Activism Education and Policy Associate at the American Friends Service Committee based in Chicago. Second, we have Tanya Harry, Executive Director uh, of the uh, Israeli human rights organization Gisha, the Legal Center for Freedom of Movement. Uh, and third, we have Omar Shaban, a political economist and analyst and founder of the PAL Think for Strategic Studies a, uh, a think tank based in Gaza City. Uh, for more about our guests, we'll be putting links to their full bios, websites, and Twitter handles in the chat box. And keep an eye on the chat box as well for links um, uh, to relevant articles and other resources about today's discussion. Uh, if you miss anything in the chat box, don't worry. Uh, all of these materials will be posted on the webpage after the event. Great, so um, the format for this teach-in series uh, is a moderated Q&A led by myself and Khaled. So we have some basic questions to get things started. We welcome questions from audience members. We encourage people to put those into the Q&A box. We'll be keeping an eye on that. So we'll try to work as many of those in as we can uh, into the discussion as it's going on, submit them at any time. Um, and heads up to everyone, this is being recorded. So as always, we're all, we're all always on the record. Uh, and if there's any technical problems, let us know via the chat box. We have colleagues who are monitoring the chat box. Uh, and with that, let's get this show started. Great, thanks, Lara. So, um, uh, so today we're obviously, we're talking about the Gaza Strip. Since 2007, Gaza has been subjected to an Israeli imposed blockade, as well as repeated military offensives by Israel uh, both of which have devastated Gaza's uh, fragile uh, economy and civilian infrastructure. The blockade has also been supported by neighboring Egypt to the south uh, and more or less acquiesced in by the international community for the last 14 or so years. Uh, as a result, Gaza and its 2 million Palestinians have long been treated as though they were somehow outside of the political process, uh, what we used to call the peace process, and in some ways, treated as though it were a separate conflict from the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict itself. Um, before we get into these issues, I thought we might uh, start with you, Jihad, just to give us a little bit of background uh, on Gaza. So I'd like to ask you maybe to help set the scene for us, give us some historical 
uh, and demographic background on, on Gaza, how Gaza came into being as an entity, uh, the nature of its population, um, and, and how it came to be isolated from the West Bank. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you, Lara. <clears throat> Hi to everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to join uh, into this great teach and, and of course, greetings to the audience. Um, so the region known uh, today as the Gaza Strip uh, came into being as a direct result of the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, which led to the establishment of the State of Israel um, and the destruction of Palestinian society as it existed uh, before 1948. Prior to the war, uh, Palestine was divided into administrative districts that made um, economic and geographic sense. Each of the major districts consisted of one or more major cities and dozens of villages. Um, one of those districts was the Gaza district, which included um, two sub-districts, Gaza, the Gaza sub-district, and the Be'er Saba or Be'er Sheva sub-district. And, and the Gaza district consisted of more than 50% of the total area of historic or mandatory Palestine. Um, and at the heart of that district, Gaza City was the political, economic, and cultural center um, of that region. Um, and it was surrounded by dozens of villages that although those villages maintained their local unique customs and traditions, for them, Gaza City was like a state capital, an economic center and market where they exchange goods and services. Um, uh, Gaza City was home to schools, was home to the Gaza College, which was founded in 1942 by Wadia Tarazi, uh, who was a graduate of Haverford College in Pennsylvania. Um, and Gaza City also had a train station that connected the district with cities like Haifa or Jerusalem. Um, and people could even make it to the Eastern Bank of the Suez Canal in the matter of hours. So again, Gaza was the capital of that district. Um, and uh, during the 1948 war, um, Zionist militias that would later form the core of the Israeli military um, expanded the boundaries allocated to the Jewish state according to the 1947 partition plan, and of course conquered uh, almost 78% of mandatory Palestine. And during the war, Palestinians um, from almost the majority of parts of Palestine were expelled by Israeli forces or just escaped the fighting in search uh, for security and temporary refuge. And for uh, thousands of Palestinians, Gaza City and the villages and towns south to the city became a safe haven for tens of thousands of refugees, um, as these territories were beyond the reach of Israeli forces. Um, as the war came to an end, the Gaza subdistrict was reduced from an area of 430 square miles to a strip of land. And, hence the term Gaza Strip, a strip of land um, of uh, only 138 square miles. The Strip, the Gaza Strip, which was already home to 100,000 Palestinians before 1948, would become also home to, uh, for an additional number of 200,000 refugees who were expelled from more than 50 towns and villages in the surrounding area and more villages and cities in the uh, larger Palestine uh, area. Um, in 1948, refugee camps were established and the organization I work with, uh, AFSC, um, was mandated by the United Nations to set up the refugee camp system in Gaza that would later be passed to UNRWA. So for Palestinians in Gaza and elsewhere, that refugee experience, which started in 1948, was thought of as a temporary experience. People thought, expected that they would be able to return to their towns, cities, properties, harvest, fields, and so on and so forth, uh, which were, which, from which they were forced to leave during the course of fighting. Um, Israel, of course, refused to allow the refugees to return 
And this is how the Palestinian refugee question uh, was born. Um, Gaza here represents a unique case because unlike the West Bank, um, a smaller geographic entity emerged as a result of the war known as the Gaza Strip, um, but it hosted a large population um, compared to the geographic area it inhabits. Um, and that geographic area did not have enough resources to provide for this population. And this is how, you know, fast forward to today, this is how we, the Gaza Strip ends up today with more than 2 million Palestinians trapped in this very small territory, 70% of whom come from towns and villages that are just within walking distance from the fence separating uh, the Gaza Strip from what is today the state of Israel. And the Gaza Strip, just to give some numbers, the Gaza Strip uh, has one of the highest population densities in the world. Um, we're talking about uh, an average of 13,000 persons per one square mile. Um, and this is, of course, you know, uh, the situation is way harsher in refugee camps, where, for example, in an area like Al Shatta refugee camp, which is an area of, uh, which has an area of 0 0.2 square miles, that's 51 hectares. Um, and just to give like a sense of comparison, the total area of the Mall of America is just 40 hectares. So, so the Shatta refugee camp is just 10 square miles, uh, is just uh, 10 hectares shy of uh, a Shatta refugee camp. That camp is almost home to 100,000 people living there. So when we talk about the population density um, and, and, and things like that. So um, uh, the population density is expected to double in 30 years. Um, and this is how the Gaza Strip came into being. It was as a geographic entity, it came into being as a result of man-made conditions, mainly the war of 1948 and the establishment of Israel. Thank you so much, Ihad. That was a tremendous uh, summary of the background. Tanya, I want to move a little more into the current day. And let's go back a little bit. Um, you know, for many years, people talked about you know, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip together, right? Um, they were both occupied territories. There were settlements in both. Um, in 2005, Israel moved its settlements out of Gaza, removed them under the disengagement plan of Ariel Sharon. Um, and then in 2007, Gaza came under the control of Hamas following elections. Because of these two developments, a lot of people, a lot of Israelis, a lot of Americans, I think people hear this in Congress a lot, have come to talk about Gaza as a completely independent entity, as Khaled alluded to, and, and no longer legally occupied, arguing that Israel is gone, it doesn't have legal obligations, it's not occupied territory, it's almost like it's an independent state. So can you talk about the situation in Gaza from that perspective? Legally, is Gaza still occupied? And if yes, why? Um, and with those two developments I described, the end of settlements and the, the beginning of the blockade with Hamas, what aspects of Israeli policy have changed towards Gaza, particularly in terms of treating Gaza now as a hostile entity and all that that entails? And then the blockade, which has been going on now for um, more than a decade. Okay, so those are a lot of questions packed into one, but I'm going to do my best to, to get through um, and succinctly. So thanks very much um, for hosting this and for the opportunity to be here and with my distinguished um, fellow panelists and, and friends. Um, so I think we should start with, um, you know, maybe busting the biggest myth that certainly exists in Israel and, and probably also um, among audiences in the US and that's that Israel uh, left the Gaza Strip and um, Gisha was actually founded in 2005. Uh, the same year as the disengagement to look at what would happen in Gaza um, after the disengagement. And there was a really already a need for an organization like ours in 2005 before Hamas came to power in 2007 because movement and access restrictions were a facet of daily life, um, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. So it's a kind of misnomer to think that movement restrictions started just when Hamas came to power. They were certainly in place for, for decades before then, and, and my colleagues can certainly share a personal perspective about that. Um, 
What we note about what happened at the time of the disengagement was that Israel didn't leave. It simply retreated to the perimeter. It remained in the air. It remained at sea. It remained in a strip of land uh, inside of the Gaza Strip that it refers to as the buffer zone. It takes liberties to enter that area at will. Last year, it entered about once per week uh, to level lands. Um, uh, and to conduct operations in those areas. It uh, sprays herbicides from the air uh, in order to kill uh, uh, weeds and vegetation in that area. It controls the population registry, the majority of fuel and electricity entering the Strip. And of course, the bread and butter of my day-to-day -day life, movement of people and movement of goods. So I say all of that um, because I think that, you know, whether you're a legal expert or not, you can agree with me that control should translate into some element of responsibility. Um, in international law, um, our analysis is that uh, the test of effective control um, still determines that Gaza is occupied. And we don't see um, occupation as a black and white question. We see it on a scale. It's a kind of... Um, shades of gray. Uh, so the situation in the Strip may look slightly different than it does in the West Bank, but that doesn't mean that Gaza is not occupied. And the fact that it is occupied means that Israel continues to, to owe um, certain obligations. Now, when Hamas took over in 2007, Israel simply used the control it already had over Gaza to um, enact what it called uh, economic warfare, uh, to close the Gaza Strip, to limit access and movement through its borders. The idea really was to put pressure on the Hamas regime and on the civilian population. So another, I think, big myth and, and um, misunderstanding about the situation is that Israel is only restricting for security reasons, and that couldn't be further from the truth. From day one, there were political goals, and they continue to this day. Um, I, I, I also... Um, you know, would want to just note that I'll be using the word closure, not blockade. Now, a blockade in international law denotes a kind of goal um, that, that Israel might have. And unfortunately, I've never heard really the goal of what Israel is doing in Gaza. There's no real end game that we can say when that goal is achieved, the blockade will end. Um, and so we use closure again to denote that Israel already had control. Now, over time and because of pressure, uh, um, certain things have changed. I would also really like to emphasize that many security officials um, within Israel noted that the uh, closure of Gaza as it was being enforced after 2007 was leading to a situation of pretty extreme desperation, uh, lack of hope among many of Gaza's young people. And they said this is actually a security threat for Israel. So what some may have seen as a, a, a kind of uh, uh, an opportunity or a, a means of putting pressure on, on the Strip, many other security officials said, hold on, don't go too far. Um, unfortunately, today, um, you know, some elements of policy have changed, but not enough to transform the situation. Israeli officials, they see Gaza as a kind of crisis to be managed, um, not one to be solved. We can get into that um, a bit more later. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that the important thing to keep in mind, like I said, is that this myth that everything that's happening in Gaza is related to security couldn't be further from the truth. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, Omar, if you could sort of uh, paint a picture for us uh, from the perspective of someone in Gaza, what what does the closure or, or blockade look like from the inside? How does it affect daily life? What are the kinds of things that are restricted, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, goods that can come in or out? Um, uh, and you know this uh, this idea that um, that Tanya noted about the absence of any clear end game. Could you pick up on that and 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 also as a as an analyst tell us what your understanding of the political goals of this uh, Israeli closure or blockade are? Um, what is the expectation that somehow Hamas will? Uh, give up its arms or, or, you know, what is the political goal behind this, if in fact there is one? So thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's my uh, pleasure. 
I think uh, there were so many reports about Gaza, but I will try to make on the more strategic thing. Gaza has pushed the siege, the Israeli siege in Gaza has pushed Gaza back around by 30 years backward. Gaza is much poorer than before. Gaza used to be a very mosaic, dynamic, diversified society. So many Israelis were coming to Gaza, staying over for two to three days. Gaza was a place for tourism from everywhere, like Greece, like Cyprus. We have a diversified society. We used to have 8,000 Christian in Gaza. Now there are 800 only, many of them left. Many of the talented people have left Gaza. Gaza, they, they are very, uh, they are very intellectually, they are very angry because they are punished for something that they didn't do. And this is what makes people are very angry in Gaza. And people are punished for something that they didn't know about when it will be released. They are in between, between Hamas in Gaza and between Israel. And the Israeli police towards Gaza has done the other side. For example, Gaza is more radical than before. As I tackle it in many articles, Gaza, Hamas become power, powerful than before. The rocket range in Gaza, the range of the rocket in Gaza, of Hamas in Gaza in 2001 was eight, eight kilometer. In 2009, it becomes 20. 2012, it becomes 40. 2014 war, it reached up to 80. So everybody. I think Ahmad is frozen. All right. Khaled, I think we should go on and come back to Ahmad when he unfreezes. Yes? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I, yeah. So actually, why don't we, Khaled, yeah. why don't you just, what, oh, there's, oh, he's back. Go ahead, Omar. You're, you're frozen. Maybe maybe turn off your video. Minute. All right. So why don't we run? Why don't we go to rounds in the next round, Khaled, and you you can go back. We can come back to Omar when he's back. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, jihad. You know, given the difficulties uh, of of life in Gaza, we saw in in recent years a the emergence of this protest movement. Um, called the, the Great March of Return, um, about three years ago when it first began, um, in which thousands of people would converge uh, on the, the fence separating the Gaza Strip from Israel um, for these weekly protests. Since then, we've seen at least 214 Palestinians were killed uh, by the Israeli army, including around 46 children, um, and more than 36,000 uh, injured, including uh, almost 9,000 children, uh, by uh, snipers and, and other military um, uh, activities by the Israeli army. What happened? Uh, well, first of all, what are the what were the main demands of this protest movement? Who was behind them, um, and what happened to them? Um, thank you, Khaled. Um, as Omar, you know, explained, and he he will get back to continue uh, his uh, analysis of how the blockade has rendered the Gaza Strip unlivable. Um, the Great March of Return, which uh, unfolded in March of 2018, was a catalyst, uh, a moment that. Uh, in which people's uh, anger and frustration and despair has exploded in the form of a protest movement that would uh, take various shapes, various forms, and would take multiple routes. Some were unfortunate, and some led to extreme bloodshed, loss of life, um, and led to a reality where now in the, on the streets of Gaza, uh, a common scene has become uh, one where you can see young people, children, w w walking with, without 
their arms or without their legs uh, on crutches by the dozens. Um, and of course, you know, protest movements are not something new to Palestinian politics or to Palestinian history. Pal protest movements start as a result of the accumulation of factors that has to do with the continuing, uh, the continued oppression of Palestinians, the denial of rights, and the uh, uh, and the structural conditions that create discrimination and deny people access not only to freedom of movement or to uh, basic needs, but also to their basic rights. We're talking about water, water electricity. Uh, travel, medical treatment, and so on and so forth. So uh, the year 2017 witnessed a number of developments that um, would push Palestinians in Gaza and elsewhere to, uh, to, to try to figure out ways to express their frustration. In December 2017, Trump announced that uh, quote unquote Jerusalem would be Israel's capital. Two weeks later, the United States, uh, the former United States administration slashed funding to UNRWA. Um, and in just in the course of a very short time, uh, Palestinians saw a great deviation uh, by the United States from its long held policies towards issues like Jerusalem or refugees, and those issues combined for are, are very dear to Palestinians, especially the refugee issue and Jerusalem issue. Um, that led Palestinians in Gaza on a grassroots level in the civil society to think of organizing a protest movement um, that would um, address the, uh, you know, that, that they would use as a vehicle to, uh, to express their frustration with these recent developments, uh, demand an end for the blockade, but also shed light on the uh, on the roots of um, uh, of why the Gaza Strip has been in turmoil for over seventy years, and that's why the March of Return was called the March of Return and wasn't called the March to end the blockade because people know that at the core of the tragedy in Gaza is the refugee crisis that hasn't been resolved uh, since 1948, and that the Gaza Strip is, um, is suffering, not only because there is a 15-year-old blockade, but also because unresolved big political questions that the current political frameworks have failed to achieve that. Now, of course, like any other protest movement, the March of Return was co-opted, partly by some Palestinian factions on the ground like Hamas. Um, they tried to use the march and, uh, and its unfolding to achieve short-term political gains to bargain with the Israelis through the Egyptians and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, um, the, the protest movement ended up, uh, which started with a vision of peacefully gathering on the Palestinian side of the fence to express all these political demands, it ended up becoming trapped in a in a in a in a in a cycle of bloodshed because on day one of the march, Palestinians lost more than fifteen people and more than fifteen hundred were injured, and and that were just the first few hours of the march, um, and that set the stage the the very brutal Israeli response from the first moment set the stage for turning the march into this uh, bloody event that unfortunately uh, ended up hurt, hurting Palestinians and creating a sense of disillusionment that a form of nonviolent protest movement uh, a gathering uh, would not lead to neither an international response, an outcry, or even uh, action on the part of the international community, nor would it shake Israeli politics and society and create any form of changes. So it's, it left Palestinians in Gaza disillusioned and promoted the vision of the current forces there that uh, their path is the path instead of uh, op creating openings for young people or the civil society to organize on its own. 
Thank you, Jihad. Omar, I, we have you back. I think we have a better connection. If you could go back to the question that we asked that Khaled asked you originally, um, that would be great. And I actually wanted to add to that question if you can also, in your, and you were going there a little bit, talk a little bit about the political realities in Gaza today, which is Hamas, how it is in leadership and how it, the nature of its rule, its control there. Um, and the relationship a little bit between Hamas um, and the PA in Ramallah, I think would be interesting as well. Thank you very much again. And uh, sorry for this connectivity is out of my control and we could not blame the occupation for this also. In a brief, there are five changes, psychological changes, intellectual changes. Gaza become less tolerant than before. Gaza become more radical. We talk about 5,000 newborn every year, every month, 60,000 newborn every year. There are 700,000 people were born in the past 14 years. And there are another 700,000 people become adult in this 14 years. Two thirds of the Gaza youth who are 62% of the Gaza population have never been outside. They become narrow-minded. It was easy 20 years ago to see Israeli, Israeli Jewish coming to Gaza, going around eating fish in the very nice restaurant in Gaza. Now it becomes very difficult for me to speak about peace, possibility peace with the Israeli. Peace is not anymore in the mind of the people. 20 years ago, we used to export the flour, carnation, chocolate, garment, good things to Israel and to Europe. Now we export radicals to Sinai and to Iraq and to Syria. For me, as a secular person, I'm 58 years old. I love Gaza. I want to stay in Gaza. I want to make a change. It becomes very difficult because the, the, the space is shrinking. And we, are, we found ourselves in the middle of a battle that we have no stake on that. We did not make anything. I don't want here to please the Israeli, but the Israeli police towards Gaza is not good, not only for us, but also for them. We are neighbors. We are 10 kilometers far away from Ashkelon. We see the light of Ashkelon 24 hours. We don't have electricity. We have electricity eight hours a day. We have no good water. The, the, we have no enough school. There is no good education. People cannot travel outside. Only a thousand, not in the corona. Before the corona, only a thousand people, a daily average, who are able to exit Israel. One thousand out of two million people with very special circumstances, coordination from Geisha and other Palestinian Israeli organizations, some students are able, have been able to get to the Jordan directly. Not in the personal level. My son is in France for 10 years. I could not bring him in again because it's very difficult for him to come to through Jordan areas to Gaza or from Egypt. So where we are heading, we are heading from bad to worse. It's a process of the development. The GDP per capita in Gaza 20 years ago was one of the best in the Middle East. Gaza are as known as entrepreneurial society. They put them themselves. There is a lot of civil society who is 100 years old. They are doing very good businesses. They used to export garment to Israel and to Europe to mark and dispenser. We used to export carnation to Europe and uh, some others to America itself, to the US, from Gaza. But now we are starving and we need money and we need food from everywhere. That's why Gaza become a place for all countries. It's easy as just to summarize, to close this, the average salary for Gaza 20 years ago, $30 per day. So if you want to recruit a youth, you have to have a thousand, you have to be him or her, a thousand dollar a month. Now by a hundred dollars, by $200, somebody in Iraq, somebody in Syria, somebody in Sinai can recruit one or two young people in Gaza doing something against us and against the Israeli. It's, it's very bad for us and Israel should be aware that we are here and Gaza will be 5 million people in 20 years time. And there is no, there is no space and there is no option. There are 20,000 fresh graduates in Gaza every year, 20,000. 1,000 is recruited by the government, another 2,000 by the private sector, which is also suffering. Where the destination of the other 16,000? We need to ask and we need to do a research about where are the destination. This is why in the siege, Gaza become very poorer up to that other country become able to intervene. Last month, Gaza celebrated the anniversary of the assassination of Soleimani, as if we are part of Iran. This is very strange to us because somebody want to use Gaza suffering 
for a political reason. And if there are many occasions where there was confrontation with Israel. I don't want to say Israel is doing a good job. Of course not. Israel is the primary reason for what we are suffering. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the consequences of the Israeli policy made it easy for others to play with our destiny, with our reality. It, many countries in the region, Saudi, Qatar, Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, Iran, are competing in Gaza, are using us as a battlefield for their, uh, for their policy. The Hamas becomes stronger than before, and you can go back to the war 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, and the other smaller uh, confrontation. We call them one day war, or two days war, or two hours war. And I lived all these wars, and my family and my two sons, they lived two wars of this. And can you imagine the young people who have never been outside, they only, they only experience the bad things. So they don't speak about peace. And we are, the Israeli policy of siege, they are graduating radical every day, every day. As I said, it's not good for us. And Israel should ask himself, what is the objective? The objective has said by the prime minister that we need to keep the Palestinian divide. Okay, I, as I said all the time, this is tactically object good for Israel, but strategically, okay, they can keep the divide for another 10 years, but then what? Gaza, you will find a 3 million Palestinian who have collective depression. As I said, community depression, the whole society is under depression. I used to travel myself, so I am in good shape a little bit, but what about the other two thirds of the society? Egypt, of course, has relation with, with Israel. Egypt does not recognize Hamas. It's part of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Egypt in the Elema, between opening the, the Rafah crossing, which is the only crossing for 95% of the Gazan, and, and uh, making relation with Hamas. So they have this checks and balance from time to time. Sometimes they have to talk to Hamas because they want the assistance of Hamas in fighting the terrorism the terrorism in Sinai, and sometimes they want to punish Hamas if Hamas does not do well here and there. So the relationship is not sustainable and is not based on in, 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 in an objective way. It's very moody between the two countries. Rafah crossing, which is the only main crossing for the majority of the Gaza and was open for the past couple of weeks, three weeks, because Egypt want to encourage the political faction to go for the election. But this crossing might be closed tomorrow or in two weeks. And there are so many thousands of Palestinians who want to leave and thousands of Palestinians in the Gulf who want to come back to their family in Gaza. And this is not good for our economy because there are so many thousands of Palestinian families who work in the Gulf or outside. When they come to Gaza, they revive the economy. So it's not only Hamas who's punished, but the majority or the, the, the whole society. If you ask the last question about BA and Hamas, Hamas is in control in Gaza. BA in control in Ramallah, there is a lot of tension, there is a lot of competition between the two, and the only two sectors that there are some sort of coordination is the health, or first the education, and the health. And there is no strategic cooperation between the two, because they don't want, each one want to see or to show our, the people in Gaza that they are the one who making good for them and the other one who making bad for them. And as I said, as I said, I described this policy is both of them, they are fighting over our bodies. BA has taken some measures against Gaza in terms of electricity, in terms of water, disconnecting the salary, discounting the salary of the BA people in Gaza who were asked to sit at home. There are around 35,000 Palestinian public servants who used to work with the Palestinian Authority in Gaza when Hamas took over in 14 of June 2007. The PA asked them to sit at home. So they have been paid for the past 14 years without doing anything. And this is a big problem also social, psychological, intellectual for those who didn't do anything. We hope, we, Palestinian guys are very excited about election, 22nd of May. The registration on the election in Gaza has reached 100%. All the Gaza will vote because the Gaza want to get rid of the situation. And I can, I can say to you, Palestinian in Gaza, they know how, whom to drop. They know whom to fail. But unfortunately, till now, they don't know whom to succeed. 
and this is also another article that I'm, 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 I'm thinking to write about it. They know who is the, to blame for the problem, but there is no emerging forces who can replace the traditional political system in Palestine, especially in Gaza. There is no, there is no uh, freedom of expression in Gaza is under control. There are so many, some many people were arrested, but the situation in West Bank is not is not uh, is not always good. And I cannot talk myself everything on this public event, but I hope it, it was useful. Thank you again. That's very useful. Thank you so much. Tanya, I, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about the wars. And both Omar and Jihad have talked about this in, in other, in the context of, of their answers. We have seen numerous wars in Gaza, 20, 2009, 2012, 2014, kids who've experienced, this is, this is the you know, repeated defining experience of their lives. Um, and, the, and, and other outbreaks of fighting, most recently in August, 2020, thousands of deaths, tens of thousands injured, mostly Palestinian civilians, and of course, widespread destruction in Gaza over and over and over. Um, talk about the causes of, of, of these wars. Why do, why do they keep recurring? And each time they end based on some sort of agreement that's in theory supposed to put in place new dynamics, and then they happen again. Uh, talk about those dynamics and, you know, if, if for, for people listening, on the hill, you know, what what could happen, what could be done to prevent this dynamic from recurring? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that there are, of course, multiple reasons for, for what's going on, but I would, would say on the broader picture, I connect very much with um, what she had and also Omar talked about. I mean, that the situation in Gaza can't be disconnected from, from 48, it can't be disconnected from what's happening in the West Bank and the kind of broader question of the conflict. It's not just that Israel is locked in a battle um, with Hamas and if Hamas disappears, then everything will be, will be solved. Um, so I do think that that's um, the first thing to kind of keep in mind, there is a political problem uh, in the region and it requires a political solution. Uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, you think might that, you know, be that solution is, is up to you. But I mean, something needs to happen on a fundamental level to transform um, the reality here. I don't think that there are kind of tactical um, answers. Um, in, in the kind of, uh, you know, since 2008, 2009, like you said, Lara, there has been this kind of pattern set where um, after, uh, you know, the, the, the war is fought, um, there's a period of kind of negotiations on a ceasefire. And then um, the parties kind of take out their like arsenal of, I always think of it as like this like poker game with a lot of chips, I don't know why. Um, but you know, the idea of kind of what are we trading in now? What will we give you to lead to another ceasefire? Um, and in my mind, you know, that idea of violence leads to certain rewards or certain changes in, in the status of the Gaza Strip, or um, it can be over the fishing zone. It can be uh, certain concessions regarding um, cash that came in through Qatar, for example. That to me has sent a message back um, um, that violence is something that that leads to change, that leads to transformation. Instead of you know Israel seeing fundamentally an obligation to residents of Gaza, seeing their well-being, seeing stability um, and well-being as as kind of inherent to something that they should be promoting, they're now locked in this kind of relationship with Hamas and certainly also with the other factions. Um, uh, 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 of kind of outbreaks of violence and the negotiations that follow them. Um, so that's another thing that I think is driving um, this, the, this kind of conflict on the localized level between Israel and Gaza. Um, I would say another major reason is because we don't view Palestinian security the same way that we view Israeli security, um, certainly uh, in Israel, but I, again, I would say also in the United States. This kind of idea of um, you know uh, Israel security being sac sacrosanct is is very beneficial for me. I live in Israel. Um, it's very nice. It's quiet in Tel Aviv. In Gaza, it's never quiet. 
Um, and that's something that we, we hear a lot in the Israeli discourse of, you know, quiet for quiet, we'll stop fighting if they stop fighting. But actually in between the um, escalations and conflict that you might read about in Washington DC, you have low level violence on a day to day basis in Gaza, whether it's actual violence or kind of the bureaucratic violence that we're confronting in our work. Like I said, things like herbicide spraying, um, firing on fishermen who were crossing a demarcation in the sea. Um, th this kind of, these actions vis-a-vis -vis Gaza all of the time. And, and I think that um, without prioritizing Palestinian security, we're going to continue to see these escalations and violence because it's not just um, these sporadic escalations that are appearing out of nowhere. They're happening in, in a larger context. And connected to that, I would say something that can be done to prevent future outbreaks is accountability. Um, it's, it's demanding accountability for the way that civilians are experiencing day-to-day uh, -day life, but certainly also the escalations themselves. Um, it, it's demanding accountability for violations of, of international law that are happening, not just by Hamas, which certainly does um, violate international law in its firing of rockets, but also by Israeli forces. Um, in, in, again, in the escalations and also in the day-to-day -day life, I don't think that we're going to see a fundamental transformation in the situation here until we recognize the need for Palestinian security, for Palestinian dignity. Uh, and like Omar is saying, um, for the young people of Gaza, 70% um, of the population under 30, if they don't feel hope um, for the future, then I, I'm, you know, I, I don't think, you, again, you need to be some kind of fortune teller or, um, you know, great analyst to realize that people in Israel and certainly in Southern Israel are also not going to have quiet and peace. Um, and, and that's not a threat. That's simply a read of every place in the world where young people don't feel hope, where they don't have jobs, you're going to see instability. And, and, and that's, that's where we are. Like I said, um, Israeli leaders, unfortunately, see Gaza as a, a situation to be managed. And I think there's certainly a lot of hubris, uh, like Omar alluded to, this kind of tactical approach of, we can, we can manage this. We can mow the lawn every few years. Um, we can close and open. We can keep the pot of water very, very hot without it boiling, I think is a lot of hubris. I think it's morally corrupt, um, certainly. And I think also just one last point, and, and that's that it connects next to, I would say, a more strategic goal that Israel has, and that's to maintain control of the West Bank. Um, the majority of the Israeli government, I, I certainly don't think that this is necessarily a, a, a position that has been in place forever, and certainly it could change, but the majority of the, the ruling uh, coalition um, wants to maintain control of the West Bank. They see this region as Israel and the West Bank is one entity and Gaza is something separate. And in order to maintain that divide, they are happy for Hamas to stay in power. They're happy even to support some of these projects, gas for Gaza, um, maybe even building a port. That's not because they are great humanitarians and they want people in Gaza um, uh, you know, to, to be more prosperous. It's because it matches their vision for keeping Gaza separate um, and maintaining control of the West Bank. So I think to, to again, to fundamentally shift and, and, and um, you know, attain a, a real and sustainable solution, we also need to talk about reconnecting Gaza um, to the West Bank and also to Israel. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I'd like to stay with you if, if we could. Um, so far, we've been talking about what is mostly a, a man-made disaster in Gaza from, uh, from different uh, perspectives. But I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a, a natural disaster that is occurring actually on a, on a global scale, and that's the COVID crisis. Um, which uh, has been felt maybe more acutely uh, in, in a place like Gaza. Um, could you give us a sense of, you know, what, what is the overall situation with regard to COVID in terms of infection and in terms of um, uh, healthcare uh, preparedness? Um, and also, if you, could, if you could touch on prospects for vaccine rollout. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw recent reports 
um, where uh, the Palestinian Authority had managed to procure, uh, I think it was like 2,000 doses that they wanted to provide to uh, to Gaza that they had secured from uh, from I believe Russian sources, uh, and those were held up for several days by by the Israelis. Um, so, what is the status of uh, of COVID and uh, the process of vaccination? What does it look like on the ground in Gaza? Yeah. Um, so I'll give a few um, updates on on the numbers. So um, to to until today, there's been about fifty five thousand confirmed um, cases uh, of the coronavirus in Gaza. A little under six hundred deaths, um, and we're seeing a, a, a slight drop in cases over the last period in Gaza, but a rise in the West Bank. In fact, a, a quite a, a troubling and quick rise which um, indicates that, it, you know, it seems that the, the um, kind of new strains, the new variants have, have managed to enter the West Bank. Um, Gaza, you know, of course, because it was closed um, in some ways early on, this protected um, the strip from, from having a larger number of cases. Also early on, you just didn't have a lot of traffic between Gaza and places like like Italy, like China, even from the US um, that protected the population. We actually didn't even see community transmission in Gaza until August. Um, and that's because the authorities in Gaza, both you know, the local authorities internally and in their management of the crisis, and also because Israel really hermetically closed uh, uh, Erez and Egypt co closed Rafa, you had a kind of panic in the strip that um, where people knew that basically the healthcare system could not deal with any sort of influx. Um, at the time, you only had a few dozen ventilators, again, for a population of 2 million people. Many of these ventilators were already in use because of this um, bakery that had exploded just before the pandemic had started. So there was a real sense that the, the, the only means of protecting the strip was to enforce a real hermetic um, uh, lockdown. And that did protect the strip in the beginning. Um, but of course, as time went on, you had people returning from abroad, um, from, from uh, uh, third countries that entered through Rafa, and uh, some travel via Israel, though very, very little. And of course, then you had um, the outbreak in the Strip. So I think that in terms of the you know, spread of the virus itself, I think the numbers are underreported. That's something that we're also hearing. There is a young population. So there are certain reasons for some slight optimism. Um, but also a lot of reasons for pessimism. I think that the, the thing that we don't talk about enough and that is pandemic related, and that is again, uh, lockdown in Gaza because Gaza was starting also from a place of serious economic hardship and poverty. So, you know, people not being able to go to their jobs. Um, you don't have a situation of kind of internet connectivity and things like that where people could work from home. So the, the kind of impact of the pandemic, I think that we really need to focus on is um, also a financial one. Um, in terms of you know movement uh, through Israel, also a, a year out, Erez Crossing is still virtually sealed. The only people who are traveling are people coming out for medical treatment. You had prior to the pandemic something like five or six thousand laborers from Gaza who were working in jobs inside of Israel. It's not a lot, but it was bringing cash um, into into households that are desperate for it. So I think that that's something that we really need to keep an eye on. Um, I think that that Israel should be doing way more to allow movement in a way that's safe, both for Israelis and for Palestinians. And it could do a lot more, but I think it's using the coronavirus closure as an excuse. Um, again, meeting it's kind of uh, the fantasy of the government here for splitting Gaza off. In terms of the vaccine rollout, um, very, very stark contrast with Israel. Israel is, of course, being reported on around the world for the success of its vaccine rollout. More than half of the population already vaccinated um, with two doses. That includes myself, thankfully, um, and all of my family. 
Um, in Gaza and the West Bank, um, even if all of the vaccines that are currently in Gaza and the West Bank were distributed all at once, which they haven't been, it would mean only 0.8% of the population having been vaccinated. That's really the, the stark um, difference. You have had some vaccines enter uh, through Rafa just last week, I believe it was. Very surprising to me, it appears to be related to the Palestinian elections. And you had this batch of 2000 doses um, that was sent from the PA to Gaza and held up by Israel for about two days. Now, the question of why that happened, I think, is somewhat of a mystery. Um, I think that there's a few reasons. Israel talked about coordination problems, um, that the PA didn't request proper coordination. I think obviously if there was political will, they could have allowed those doses to travel into the strip swiftly. There's another thing that's happening, and that's that um, allegedly Hamas is holding the bodies of two soldiers since the 2014 war, and also two civilians who um, are thought to be alive. And uh, Israel is trying to negotiate for the release of those uh, civilians and those bodies. It's a subject that is um, very painful um, to Israelis. I, for me on a personal level, the two civilians who are being held are both mentally um, unstable. Um, I think that they should be released anyway, but I would certainly very, very much oppose conditioning the entrance of aid and certainly vaccines um, on their release. Um, and that's speaking at, you know, as an Israeli. There was a question about whether the shipment was delayed because in these very days, the family of one of the soldiers um, had filed a petition to the high court to try to block entrance of vaccines. So there's a bit of a question about what's going to happen going forward. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the international community should be pressuring Israel to provide vaccines. Um, it does have an obligation under, uh, under international law to provide those vaccines, but at the very, very minimum, it should not be blocking vaccines that are sent in by others. Thank you, Tanya. Um... And you've, I think, addressed a lot of questions that people in Congress probably have um, based on what they're hearing every day, the who, who's really responsible and who's doing what. Um, I want to come back to you, Omar. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, I want to come back to the question of elections. Um, you talked about looking forward to elections. The Palestinians in Gaza are looking forward to elections. Um, some in the U.S. and in Israel are already calling for Hamas to not be permitted to stand in elections. Obviously, Hamas is a designated terrorist organization under U.S. law, under Israeli law. Talk about the, the challenge that this poses. Um, you know, is it possible to have legitimate elections that will be seen as legitimate by Palestinians if they don't include Hamas? And if they are going to include Hamas, um, what, what are your thoughts on how the international community should deal with that? Um, we saw what happened in the last PLC elections where Hamas participated as the party of change and reform and ended up winning. And it, it basically opened the era we're in today with the international community, um, Israel and the US saying we reject, the, we reject the results of a free and fair election and we actually will punish the people for having voted wrong. So can you, can you talk about how that is going to play out and be, be pretty short because we want to get to at least one more question for, for the other panelists? First of all, I think it's good for us, for our political system to include Hamas in the, in the election. It should not be left out. Otherwise, they will be in the, in the corner and they will not, they will destabilize the situation. The question is that whether we should ask a party to, to recognize Israel or to to abide with the international law, I think the government should do that. And the international community has asked it, the Hamas-led government, which was formulated in March after the election 2006, to recognize the three conditions Hamas-led government didn't, didn't do. We hope this time there will be a coalition government led by the PA, the Palestinian Authority, where some of Hamas or second line of Hamas, this is what, what they are talking now, could be part of the government. We want Hamas to be part of the political system. It's educational process. It's a, it's a process where they can be part of a legitimate process. It might take a couple of years. The international community should help the Palestinian to reform our political system. I don't want to go into details, but Hamas and Fatah are not political party. They are political movement. Their legitimacy based in history. 
they are not registered in the Ministry of Interior. So we have to do something at our home. We need to issue, President Abbas need to issue the law how to formulate a political party. There is a debate within Hamas that Hamas need to distinguish between ideology and political party like the case in Tunisia or in Turkey. There is a debate within the movement. It's sometimes it gets, it gets up, sometimes goes down. We need to help. Myself in Gaza, I believe that we can influence what's going in Hamas. Hamas is not anymore a secretive movement. They have election within the leadership that started last Friday and until February. There is, Hamas is like the iceberg. It's not like 20 years ago that everything was very, very secret. Now we know a little, a little bit about what's going on. There is a competition between the politician and the military. And we, the environment, the contest of the Gaza Strip can influence what's going inside the movement because they are in the government. Hamas has 40,000 public servants in Gaza. Hamas has learned how to govern. Of course, they need to, to do something to, to, to meet the international community. It's not an easy question. The main principle that I can call that Palestinian people themselves should not be punished by the political purposes. If the international community want to boycott Hamas, maybe we don't like this, but we should not be punished by something that we don't, we are not part of it. It's a process that we need to be involved as civil society, as a Palestinian authority, as a political movement, as political analyst, we should look, we should start a process. And this is what all the time I keep I saying, we should start a process where the Palestinian political system should transfer into more legitimate. It's not, by the way, it's not the problem with Hamas. There are other 14 political faction. Some of them, they have military willing. Also like Hamas, we have the BFLB, we have the DLFP, and there are so many other military group who emerged in the past for 14 years that they don't recognize Israel and they don't want peace because they are affiliated with other groups outside in the region. And as I said at the beginning, the Israeli siege has given Gaza easily to the hand of others. So Gaza become a platform or a kitchen where everybody is cooking in our kitchen, apart from us. We don't, we are not in the radar. We don't influence the situation. And because we are punished by the Israeli policy, why also were punished by the international, the position of the international community. It's not easy thing, but we need to think together how we get rid of out. Hamas is not going to leave. They cannot disappear. They are not, they are 20% of the society. It's possibly that Hamas, when they go to election in 22nd of May, they might get 30 to 40 seats. They will not get the majority according to different polls. I think some of them, they don't want to get the majority. They don't want to leave the government. They want to be part of the political system. And there is a debate, strong debate within the movement between the politicians, between those who believe that they need to be part of the legitimacy and those who think that Gaza is the end of the story. And Gaza is too small. Gaza 362 kilometers square. But many people who didn't leave Gaza, they think Gaza is too big, like Texas. They don't know that Gaza is, is like what a district in, in, in Washington. It's too small to be a, a state or to be a country. But how you expect people who have never been outside to think about the whole world? It's, it's our interest, it's Israel's interest, is the stability for the Middle East to open Gaza, to open the mind of the people, to get them socialized and contact with outsiders. Thank you. Khaled, it's with you. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Jihad, why don't you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, your thoughts on uh, uh, on elections, uh, even though you're currently in um, in Chicago? Yeah. Um... In 2006, when the Palestinian Legislative Council elections were held, I was one of the youngest uh, election observers. I wasn't able to vote. I wasn't uh, still, you know, uh, 18. And uh, I spent my entire night uh, as a poll watcher. Uh, it was an exciting moment that, that Palestinians uh, were voting. Uh, Former President uh, Jimmy Carter came to Gaza and went, you know, traveled all over Palestine. 
Um, and for people, that was a promising moment because they were engaged in a democratic process that was unprecedented in the Middle East, uh, unmatched in terms of the transparency and the levels of participation um, and the levels of engagement of the population in the political process. Um, unfortunately, the results weren't liked much by the international community. And instead of engaging with Palestinians, the international community treated Palestinians in this condescending, infantilizing, uh, uh, violent way um, by imposing collective punishment on an, the entire population just because the Palestinian people did not elect or did not vote for what, what the international community then viewed as you know, the, uh, the parties that should have been voted for. Um, and, and this is a fundamental problem with how the international community approaches Palestinian politics. Nobody comes and says the Likud party has to change its charters or has to change its principles in order for the Likud to run in Israeli elections. And nobody comes and says the entire Israeli population needs to be punished because the Likud party does not recognize Palestinian rights for statehood uh, or for sovereignty. Nobody says that uh, Israelis should be put under blockade and their political system should be destroyed. They should be fragmented. Uh, we should uh, prevent them from developing like the rest of societies on earth just because the Likud party has a line in the charter that says uh, all of, all of uh, Palestine is all of the land of Israel and that includes Gaza and the West Bank. So the approach, the imposition of collective punishment for 15 years as a response by the international community to election results did not lead anywhere. And as Omar explained, Hamas is still there. It's, it's a social movement rooted in a, in a very powerful grassroots base that defied all the attempts to uh, use collective punishment to, you know, for, to uh, get the Palestinian people in Gaza or elsewhere to rebel against them. And this formula of collective punishment when a certain government is elected uh, never succeeded, succeeded anywhere else, neither in Latin America or in the Arab world or in any other corner of the third world. It's a, it's a, it's a formula that does not work. We saw what the Iraq sanctions have led to, and we saw what other forms of collective sanctions that are imposed on people because they uh, supposedly vote for the wrong factions. So I think we are dealing, I think uh, as we approach the, the, uh, the Palestinian elections, we need to, sorry, we need to, um, I apologize. we need to, uh, the international community led by the United States, because it's the most important player in that, in that regard, needs to approach uh, the question of Palestinian politics, the question of how to sit with Palestinians, how to talk to them, in a much more sophisticated manner, in a manner that does not say, oh, well, if Palestinians don't follow this or that uh, term, we will use discipline and we will impose another 15 year of blockade and we will impose collective punishment on them and we will besiege them and destroy their economy and destroy their society. And this, is, this, is, this fundamental change needs to take place soon. Or, uh, you know, and probably the polls Omar refers to uh, are right, but what if Hamas wins again in the 2000, 2021 elections in Palestine? Is the, the people, kids who were 10 years old in 2007 after the Legislative Council elections that led to the blockade, those kids were born in the blockade. They knew nothing but the blockade. And they are young people now, younger than me, who, who get to vote. Are they also going to live and experience a blockade? Are they going also to lose uh, is another generation also going to be doomed just because uh, what the international community perceives as the wrong political choices are being made? So I think um, an approach, and also, you know, just one last thing, Palestinians, Palestinians have given so much, and even the Palestinian Authority that is engaged in security coordination with Israel, 
that is fulfilling all the requirements that Israel asks for and the international community asks for, still this framework that reduces the entirety of the political question to questions of terrorism and security are used against them. And we saw that in the Trump era, and it still continues here with anti-terrorism laws that are being deployed you know, as tools to even suppress the Palestinian Authority that, that does its best and even more to the, to the contrary of Palestinian wishes, to the you know, Palestinian public's wishes in terms of fulfilling its role. So I think th th there are really like abstract questions here that we as actors uh, who are engaged with all of these questions, whether on the Hill, whether you know, as think tanks, you know, organizations that do Palestine advocacy and beyond, we need to engage to so that we can understand how this coming moment, uh, um, land, you know, watershed moment in Palestinian politics will unfold, and how to not to repeat the mistakes of 2006, 2007. Thank you so much. And Tanya, you're going to get the last word. And I want to come back here to something that you said earlier. Um, when you talked about, you know, Gaza is, is this is a man-made problem. It has a, it's a political problem. It has political solutions. One of the challenges, I think, for people talking about Gaza is trying to prioritize, you know, where to engage, you know, ur it's the urgent versus the important. Uh, we're going to do next week's teaching is actually going to be looking at refugees and UNRWA more directly. Can you talk about in the Gaza situation, both the urgent and the important in that construct, you know, funding for UNRWA as the, you know, the problem, restoring West Bank, Gaza connection, uh, dealing with movement and access, you know, for people who need, talk about that, that, that urgent versus important piece of it and, and the broader framing. And you have three minutes for that, but you can go a little over. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm really glad that you didn't ask me about Israeli elections. Um, so I think that there are some complicated uh, actors running in, in the elections here as well. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with that that framing of, of urgent uh, um, and important. Obviously, all of it is, is, is quite important. I do think that in the immediate term, there really is no alternative for providing humanitarian and development aid in Gaza. The situation is such um, that there's no way to provide enough jobs or enough kind of influx of um, uh, you know, uh, support in, in a way that would really meet the needs of the population. So I think restoring funding to UNRWA, to USAID, um, is critical and and certainly also other American organizations that are that are operating on the ground or that had been operating on the ground um, more um, prior to the last administration. Um, and I think supporting those organizations to do their work, no matter what happens, you know, politically is also key. Like Jihad is saying, the, the population of Gaza cannot be punished for the actions of militants uh, over whom they have no control. That is a fundamental thing that needs to change. Um, and I think will we'll gradually kind of lead to greater prosperity. Um, I, I think also a, a matter of, of immediate importance is movement and access. And um, like I said, the coronavirus closure on Eras Crossing needs to be lifted. I think laborers should be allowed to come out of Gaza again. Um, there are laborers coming in from the West Bank throughout the pandemic, um, there's been a way to do that. They should also, of course, all be vaccinated um, so that they can access their jobs safely. That would also bring cash into people's hands. Um, movement of goods and expanding movement of goods can also happen today. I mean, really with no uh, extra political capital, there are companies inside of the Gaza Strip that are producing products that could be sold in the West Bank and Israel and in markets abroad. Um, Israel could be lifting restrictions on goods going out and goods coming in, um, inputs for industry, et cetera. And I think the American administration has a big role to play here and Congress has a role to play here. Um, uh, they've been active in the past and it's led to some changes in policy. So there's really no reason to lose hope. There's a lot that really can be done without a lot of money. Um, it's really just a, an issue of political will. And then, yeah, in the, in the medium term, I think restoring Gaza's connection to the West Bank, to Israel, um, to the region more broadly. Like I said, there really 
is no solution for Gaza without a holistic um, political solution uh, um, you know, that would bring prosperity, I think, both to Israelis and Palestinians. So thanks very much. Um, that's uh, pretty much all the time that we have. Uh, so on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Middle East Peace, um, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you to our panelists, uh, Jihad, Tanya, and Omar. Um, if you, uh, uh, we're hoping that you can join us uh, for uh, next week's session at this same time. Uh, where we're going to be looking at the issue of Palestinian refugees uh, and UNRWA. Um, so uh, please join us again then, and, and thank you again for, for joining us today. Thanks so much, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you all.